Dave Pascoe, welcome. The number one most compared person to Brian Johnson. Why do you think that is? Hmm. You know, that's a great question. I wondered that a lot myself. I, I think probably because I was beating him for about a year, although not anymore, but I was. And so I just think uh, that attack uh, captured people's attention and imaginations. That's my guess. Well, you were not the only one who was beating him, right? Oh, that's very true. That's very true. There were a lot of people. I mean, I was like number six. So there was five other people beating yeah. him ahead of me. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Maybe, maybe both of you have some main character vibes there. Speaking of comparison, I want to talk about someone else here. Are you familiar with Michael Lasgarten? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've been in contact yeah. with him. I'm going to be mm -hmm, doing mm -hmm. an episode for his channel. He's going to review all of my blood work. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good opportunity. I just had a conversation with him two days ago, and he talked, and I presented to him his method, right? That what he's doing is he's testing, and he's doing some correlation statistical magic, and then he figures out what to do, right? What, what Brian Johnson is telling, what he's doing, but Lars Garten is doing more like more rigorously or, or he's doing the thing, not his team. Right? right. Um, in any case I mentioned, or I contrasted this approach to him, to you, that as far as I understand your approach is more like, uh, fuck around and find out <laughs> how true is that? I love that as a description. Um, yeah, there's some truth to that. I mean, I, I started you know, mucking around with this stuff um, at least a decade ago. I, I think I'm, my approach is probably a little bit more scientific now than it used to be. I mean, before I just took supplements and I had no real idea why or whether I needed them. Now at least I can do testing and I can see whether it's something I need, it's something I'm deficient in, and that maybe I'm getting too much of. So in, in that regard, at least I know a lot more than I used to know. And so it's, it's more, more of a guided approach. Plus, you know, now there's so much more information out in the literature, uh, in books, in podcasts, experts that are talking about different longevity supplements and things that our body produces normally when we're younger that we produce less of as we get older. And so those are things that, you know, knowing those, it has helped me to target, you know, my supplementation and what I'm doing so that I'm not just picking things out of the blue. But I, but I definitely will try things just to see how they affect me, like for my end of one. You, you see, I'm not, uh, I'm not against uh, this approach of constantly trying things and being, being in, in, in somewhat of a chaotic pace uh, compared to Michael Lasgarder, right? Yeah. Um, everyone is chaotic because there are, there are other, other let's say disciplines, for example, entrepreneurship, um, there is a, there is a way of that's called a blitz, blitz scaling when you have to scale up a company very fast. And we had very similar experience when users started to use our, 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 our software and, and the money started to come in and we had to keep hiring people, even though we had no idea if those people are going to be good or not. And even when they, when they turned out to be not good, if they didn't create trouble, we are not firing them. Right. We, I only fired people who created trouble. Those people who didn't do much or didn't do that job. They were like, you know, they were, I considered them as, as reserves, right? They, they were there that when something happens, then we can, we can pull them into and, 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 and get them to work properly. And, and this seems very wasteful, like you're wasting a lot of money to a bunch of supplements and most of them don't work, but, but waste is something that, uh, organic, like a dynamic system has to, has to work with, has to tolerate. So I personally like, like that approach. And I, if I'm mischaracterizing you, then please tell me. No, I don't disagree with what you're saying. It depends on what you're trying to target though. I, I know some folks are really just interested in longevity. I mean, you know, Brian talks about longevity as his sole approach and 
almost everything that he seems to do based on what I've heard from his podcasts and things are to the end of longevity. And that's really not my main concern. My main concern isn't longevity. My, my main concern is health span. So I'm, I'm looking for things that will, well, all right, so let me put it this way. To me, longevity and the whole pace of aging uh, are mostly moved, in my opinion, um, based on diet, exercise, sleep, you know, the basics. I, I think you're probably going to ask me this later about something that I believe that uh, other people probably don't believe. But I think <laughs> our whole pace of aging is... Uh, Oh, really... you listened. You listened oh, to you, some yeah. episodes. I'm doing my homework on your previous podcast. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that our pace of aging scores, like the people that are 0. 0.7, 0. 0.8, 0. 0.6, I think that those are actually normal. I think the higher pace of aging scores are abnormal. I think that's what the food that we eat, the lifestyles that we live, you know, all of the processed foods and the chemicals and things that are added in that. I think that's what makes us age faster. So the people that are on the Rejuvenation Olympics leaderboard, in my opinion, from what I've seen of talking with some of those folks, the things that they have in common are the things that they don't do. It's the things that they remove, right? And that's what seems to have the biggest lever to longevity. So having said that, you're probably going to ask, which I would ask reasonably, okay, Dave, if you believe that, then why do you take all those stupid supplements, right? Um, and that's a valid question. But the supplements, in my opinion, really aren't to address longevity. They are address, they're to address the higher level organ systems like the brain, eyesight, heart health. Because you can, you can live a very, very long life. You can have longevity and still go blind. You can have longevity and still go deaf. You can have longevity and still get hardening of the arteries. You know, you can lose your hair. I mean, there's still things that I'm interested in preserving rather than just my longevity. I want to improve my health span. And so to me, that's what the supplements are there to target. So for example, I know from genetics that I have three genetic markers for the same macular degeneration that my dad suffered from. So many of my supplements are targeted for my eye health. So I take lutein, anthocyanin. Um, Ash, I'm trying to think now, uh, luteolin, they do take things specifically for different organs, brain health, heart health, eye health, you know, things like that. I, I, I want to pick up on many things there. Um, maybe, maybe just a quick note that, uh, actually just with my conversation to refer back to Michael Lasgarden, it turns out Brian is interested in more than just longevity. Brian is interested in vanity because when I asked Michael that, oh, uh, what, what's with your hair? Why don't you have hair? It's like, well, that's, that's nothing to do with longevity, right? <laughs> but Brian is interested in these kind of things, right? So, so there is, there is some and his facial more comprehensive. And, yeah. maybe, maybe the facial stuff is longevity stuff. I don't, I don't know. Maybe vanity. Um, well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with appearing youthful. I mean, I dye my hair. Right. Of course. I would be completely gray. In fact, I started going gray when I was in my thirties. So I've been coloring my hair for 30 years. Um, so, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't fault anybody for wanting to look younger. You want to look the way you feel. So why not? Oh no, it wasn't a criticism. It was yeah. just a notion that, oh, there are other objectives to Brian's protocol than longevity itself. Because if you would really want to max it out, then. It's like Las Garden, who's like, well, my hair is going away. It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, so I, I this is just on a little bit on Brian for that too. So I'm actually trying to defend him, even though I, mm -hmm. I like to tease a little bit about that. <laughs> okay, this is just a quick, quick note here. Another quick note is that uh, what what you notice is, I think that that is the main thing that I noticed as well. That people don't have vices here. They are not smoking. They are not drinking. They are not no hookers and coke. No, 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 nothing. Right? Like the the best they can come up with is sometimes I eat a little bit of donut. You know, chocolate <laughs> like, cake for birthday. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Once a week. Potato chips. I can sit and eat an entire bag of potato chips if you let me. How often? 
How often? Oh, um, gosh. Well, I try not to buy them, so I don't have them to tempt me. Um, yeah, maybe once every couple of months. Um, any, any real vices? Like, <laughs> like something that you actually do and oh, does I, make you burst? Oh, I, I do drink alcohol. I mean, I have a, a group of friends that are, I call them my drinking friends. Um, we get together and do margaritas. We like to go to concerts, oh, have a beer, you know. Oh, how often? Oh, gosh, we get together about once a week or once every two weeks. Now, I don't mm -hmm, always, mm -hmm. I don't always consume mm -hmm. with them. I might just have a beer or maybe I'll have just one margarita instead of multiples. But yeah, it's enjoyable. And you stay out all night? No, <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> usually when we go out to concerts, we're kind of early birds because we don't like to fight the traffic. So we, we tend to leave before the last, you know, the last couple of songs. So, you know, we're, I guess I'm home by maybe 1 a.m. in those cases. Uh, because I just listened to a podcast with you with someone who just came out, I think, before yesterday. And you, yeah. Stephen, he, he told the story. Yes. And yeah. Stephen told a story about you that, uh, that you, you didn't want to go out at night because you are very protecting of your sleep. That's true. Um, in his, his particular case, um, he wanted me to go out. It was uh, starting at 930. Now, I had just come from Detroit. So 930, you know, Las Vegas time is 1230 Detroit time. So we would have oh. been we've been starting our evening at 1230 a.m. And that was like that was way too late for me. So I knew that by the time I came home, it would be, you know, maybe 3 a.m. or later, you know, still on Detroit time. So yeah, there was no way I could have hung with that. Can can we can we zero into this uh, this this frequency thing here? So it's it's not fair to say that you you go out and drink a decent amount of alcohol every week and and don't go home until one a.m. Yeah, I'd say it's fair to say that I don't do that that often. But uh -huh, uh -huh. once a week, I have the potential of doing that. Uh -huh, so I'm not, uh -huh. I'm not militant about anything that I do. I mean, nothing. Because I want to live my life. I have, I have friends. I, I want to go out and, I mean, what's the point of longevity if you're not living your life, right? If you're tucked away and you're avoiding people and you're avoiding going out and having fun and living, then what good is life? Yeah, you know, like. The real longevity cure will be when you can sit around, smoke weed and cigars all day, and and, and you still live forever, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's probably coming. Who knows? Well, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> I want to talk about your statistics here. Firstly, your chronological age is sixty. Okay, I, I just say statistics and you are going to correct me. All right. Your chronological age is 65. Your biological age is, I don't know that. Uh, your average pace of aging is 0 0.74, on, at least on the Rejuvenation Olympics leaderboard. And you are 10th on the Rejuvenation Olympics leaderboard. Am I? Did I get something wrong here? Yeah, um, so my chronological age will be 62 here in another week or two weeks. Oh, okay. Um, okay, okay. Biologically speaking, it depends on whose test you're looking at. Um, so the last two diagnostic tests I had, I think my biological age was 37.95. Um, that's the one I put on my, um, my website. Omic MH, right? Yeah. Um, some of those, again, depending on whose test I use, will say that my biological age is like 53. I'm at least, according to most biological tests, I'm at least 10 years younger than my actual age. Huh. And then as far as my ranking on the Rejuvenation Olympics leaderboard, that varies day to day. So I think if, I, if you actually click and sort on uh, best pace of aging, I would tie for 13th place. And so that list changes the actual ranking changes every single day so i don't know what i am today so right now you are 10th and uh, and and what's interesting is that julie was a big loser of the rule change of the rejuvenation olympics 
yeah. because you have to have X amount of tests. Otherwise, you're not going to be verified. And if you're not verified, you are automatically, I think, 60 plus place, right? You cannot get better than that. Yeah. So, so, so what I wanted to say there is that there are people who have good results, but didn't do enough tests. And, uh, and, and anyway, anyway, I, I, I want to get to something else here. So there was an update of the Rejuvenation Olympics. When, when this update happened, there, I think they made a big, they made a mistake. And I think Rejuvenation, I think True Diagnostic accidentally published a bunch of data that they were not supposed to publish. And that was the Symphony Age data. And your Symphony Age data was published. And oh, me being the hacker, I saved that data and Stay. now checked it. And you know what? Um, your lungs are messed up, man. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, what? Let, let me tell you how messed up they are. It's interesting to know. You are 171 on the, on the leaked update that they removed. And I am 162. And I, I, I don't... I never said this publicly, but I think now is the time if, if it's any, any time, because I have smoked for 15 years of my life and I smoked other things as well, not only cigarettes. Right. So, so the thing is that you have a worse lungs than a 10 plus year smoker. So tell me about that. I know exactly why that is too. So when I was in college, I, I worked maintenance in the dorms over the summers. And one of the things that we used to do regularly, like most of the summer, would be to tear the wax off of the terrazzo floors with ammonia. We would just take, you know, gallons and gallons of ammonia with a knife, just cut them open, just pour the, the raw ammonia on the floor and take a buffer and strip the wax off. So we were in very enclosed areas, breathing nothing but pure ammonia. And then for the rest of the, the rest of the summer, I mean, that would, we'd probably do that for maybe three, four weeks. The rest of the summer I was painting. So I was using oil-based paints again in fairly enclosed places painting. And I, I knew at the time that wasn't really good for my lungs. I just had no real perception of how bad that was going to mess me up. I do notice it when I run that, um, you know, my, my running is labored or my breathing is labored, I should say. And so I'm a very slow runner and I've been trying to overcome that. So I've been watching my VO2 max, you know, climb as I've been training, but it's, it's been a, a long, slow fight. How, how are you trying to overcome that? What strategies do you have? Um, so I would love to say that I've been doing, um, prescribed VO2 max training. Cause I know people do have good training plans for that. Um, in doing marathon training, I'm mostly just focusing on zone two training, but um, I've been told by a, a trainer that I have a whole another gear that I've never explored, which is my, um, would be my anaerobic gear, my zone, like zone five, I guess it would be. And so I've been trying to focus a little bit more on that recently, you know, just doing more sprints, doing hill repeats. You know, I've actually found, I, I bought a Carol bike back in November and I've been using that because it uses rehit. So it's, I do the two 20 second sprints on the Carol bike. And for the longest time, I didn't really think it was doing anything for me, to be honest, because the, it's an AI driven bike. And so it keeps changing the resistance, you know, based on how you're doing. So to me, it felt like I was never getting any better. It was always just as hard. But one of the things I noticed this year when I, I did the American Lung Association Fight for Air Climb, I do that every year. This year, it involved running up and down bleachers at uh, Comerica Stadium in Detroit. And it was, you know, it's always been a, a good challenge for me. And I've always trained prior to, you know, doing the, the actual event. This year, though, I didn't get to train at all. And I was shocked when I looked at my results after the fact, because I really just thought I was having fun. It wasn't I didn't think I was breathing heavy. I didn't think I was really pushing myself. My score in completing that was better than any of the four or five years prior. And I came in, I think I was like, 
a minute short of coming in first for my age group, which <laughs> really shocked me. I thought, wow, I don't, I, didn't, I can't even fathom what would have accounted for that. And then later I had to, I had to do some training for Mount Kilimanjaro. So that's another story. I didn't get to go because of the global tech disruption and Delta Airlines. But um, in training for that, I was doing a lot of, um, a lot of high miles. And my, my first six mile run, again, without any kind of buildup, I, I just started right in the middle of the training program, was better than the time of my six mile runs ever. And I'm like, the only thing I'm doing different is this Carol bike. And I truly believe the Carol bike has improved my cardiovascular fitness just from that. I didn't mean this to be a commercial. It's just that this completely surprised me because, again, I didn't think I was improving. But um, apparently that was really helping my, my VO2 max. It was helping my cardiovascular fitness. So, so, so it's like a normal bike, but with AI adjusted resistance to be in your zone of proximal development mm -hmm. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. and do like two 20 second all out sprints just as fast as you can with i think two minutes of you know uh, mild pedaling in between to catch your breath before the next 20 second sprint and 20 seconds doesn't sound like a lot but when you're doing it it feels like it's forever um uh oh what about all kinds of breath work stuff? You never done anything? I, um, you know, I, I own the Wim Hof breathing method, uh, several of his courses. Um, I used to do them regularly. I've completely fallen off the, the habit of that. I think uh, I was still doing it through the pandemic in 2020, but I think uh, it was probably 2021, I, I lost the habit. So I have not been doing that since. But I do need mm -hmm. to pick it up. I'm actually doing that right now. Um, it's a, I, I'm not doing it through Wim Hof, but there is a woman who is, who's putting up YouTube follow along videos, which are progressively harder, right? So she's, she's making every video harder. Therefore, as you're progressing with that, you actually feel like, ah, this is, this is something is happening. Although I'm still at the first progression, but I've done her carbon dioxide tolerance, which is just breath hold. And I, for in half a year, I get from, I don't know, from 30 seconds breath hold to one minute, 30 seconds. And I felt really good about that. So mm -hmm. I started doing her Wim Hof stuff now. And, uh, but I don't know if these work. I mean, they definitely do something, but, uh, but I don't know if they I hope you're gonna share, make a difference. I hope you'll share the links mm. to that in your show notes because I'd like to give that a try. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, free your breath. Free your breath. Yeah, it's actually a very undersubscribed YouTube channel. But I, you know, what I've been doing for a, for a while now is that every every midday I do a breath work exercise. Um, it's a, a follow along YouTube video. Every week I change the video. And so in, for one week, I practice one breath work. And this way I got really familiar with a lot of different kind of breathing techniques. And I just, I just found this channel where, you know, most of these things don't have any progressions in it, right? When you're working out, you, you want to progressively overload, but most of these, okay, so sit down and do the, I don't know, this kind of breathing five times and box breathing and six in, six out. That's gets boring in, in, in after two sessions. Right. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but sometimes you, you found the gem that you can just level up with anyhow. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, fucking around and find out that you were talking about before. You gotta try things and see how they fit for you. Exactly. Um, let's let's move on to something that was very curious to me. That in the symphony age, your musculoskeletal system was one hundred seventy-one, as bad as your lungs. Really? Interesting. Well, now, do we know? But that you got the result. But you got the results, right? Was that live data? Or was that test data? Or what? Do we know that okay, that was? Okay, so 
when they updated the website, <clears throat> they have published the Symphony Age as well, but they then a day later removed that. So a lot of people's Symphony Age records have been have been out there, right? Yeah. And 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 your muscular skeletal system is is also one hundred seventy one base. <laughs> But like, but wait a moment because didn't you receive it in in true diagnostics so your own r records? No, because I haven't uh, I haven't paid for the Symphony Age yet. Oh yeah, I see, I see, I see. Okay, well if you don't want to pay, no. then I can exactly. send it to you. <laughs> well, you know it's funny because I I caught that when they had accidentally released it, and I had looked at that and I. The data just seemed like it was all over the place. So I I didn't take any stock in any of it when it first came out because I, I thought maybe this was just test data. I didn't think it was really live data. But you have me super curious now, so I'm going to pay the extra money and, and do the Symphony Age because I, now I really want to know. It wouldn't surprise me about my lungs, though. But the muscular skeletal system, that, that does surprise me. That was very surprising as well. Well, I, I got a theory here that... I, I, I've been, I have been 12 in musculoskeletal, right? And I've been working out and, and everything without problems, but I'm also pretty overweight. So my theory is that you're skinny and I'm fat and I, therefore I have a lot more muscle to carry around as well than, than you are. But, uh, well, you might, you might figure out what's going on later on. <laughs> I know you, my, my muscle mass changes radically from time to time because I keep stripping down and I keep building back up again. So every time I train for another half marathon or marathon, I end up stripping myself down radically. And then once that event is over, then I start rebuilding again. So yeah. Uh -huh. it's uh -huh. all over the place. So something else that was also one of the worst is your heart. Hmm. Interesting. Any any idea why? You're like the doctor giving me the bad news here on, uh, you know, a public <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Am I Chris Helmsworth learning that I've got like dementia in my, my cards? I got three bad news, but I got one good news. Your hormones, your hormones were exceptional. Why, really? why is that? <laughs> yeah. That's fascinating because I'm still working on those. I'm still working on tweaking those. I'm, I'm doing a lot of work on that. But my heart, my heart was not good either. Huh? That's fascinating because um, I, I actually have a cardiologist appointment uh, with, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Joel Kahn. He has his own podcast. He's America's Healthy Heart Doc. Um, I did a few tests with him about a month ago, and I'm coming in to talk to him about that tomorrow and see my results. Probably going to end up doing a clearly CT scan. Um, I'm also looking to do a Pronovo full body MRI. Um, but I've been given a clean bill of health so far, heart-wise. So that's interesting. Okay. Well, I don't know how correct this is, but if we are looking at my data, it is completely correct for me. My worst is lungs and metabolic health, which is like, that's what I know that because of the smoking, my lungs are not great and because I'm fat. My metabolic health is not great, but the best is my musculoskeletal system and my heart. And that makes perfect sense because I've been working out since I know myself and my heart is, I actually have some genetically good heart or something like that. And, and I've been also doing soccer for, I don't know, 20 years. Uh, the first 20 years of my life so so my heart should be pretty good but uh may, maybe some may, maybe your data is the uh, okay now this is this is definitely wrong because how can i have a six pack and have bad musculoskeletal system right <laughs> it is puzzling it didn't surprise me that there was other metabolic issues because i mean i know people that are like you know weightlifters, bodybuilders that are just metabolically destroyed. Yeah, I mean, that's Well, not... but that's the metabolic system. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm, okay. I'm just saying that, you know, looks can be deceiving sometimes. Okay. Tell me about your telomeres. My telomeres. Wow. Well, 
back in 2012 was the first time I heard about telomeres. And I was just turning 50. I was just training for my first marathon. And um, I heard that, you know, telomeres get shorter as we age, because every time the cell divides, they get shorter. And so I thought I'd get my telomeres tested because I, I just assumed that it was going to come back and tell me I have the telomeres of a you know 20-year-old, right? But no, I was shocked when the results came back. It said I had the telomeres of a 68-year-old, and I was only 50 at the time. So that was a big surprise. And I, I thought at that point that I was doing all the right things as far as exercise and, you know, nutrition, you know, within reason, I was just doing what everybody else was doing. So I didn't think that that was out of the ordinary, but I did a consult with this particular company that gave me the results and they asked me questions about you know, my lifestyle. So they said, you know, just tell me about your, your average day, you know, what, tell, tell me about your job and things like that. So I'm like, well, yeah, I'm a, I'm a network security architect and engineer. It's incredibly stressful. Things go from you know zero to a hundred miles per hour in about two seconds flat sometimes. You know, and then I I'm, I'm tasked with working around the clock to get whatever the situation is resolved. So it's super super stressful. And I'm also you know living with and taking care of both of my parents who are down hard with cancer, uh, their second cancer piece. Um, so this time they couldn't take care of each other. So. I was there to do that. And then, of course, I was training for my first marathon. I was doing P90X, which is a really extreme workout program. And they're like, whoa, 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 stop, stop. Okay, so we've seen this before in, you know, really long endurance athletes that have much shorter telomeres because of the stress that they put themselves under. We've seen it with caretakers of elderly parents because of the stress that that involves. We've seen it with like, you know, type A personalities and, you know, very hard driven people that are, have stressful jobs, but you've got the trifecta going on. You've got all of those. And uh, their suggestion to me was that I really need to look into getting um, a good program for managing that stress. And so their recommendations were things like yoga and uh, meditation, which kind of blew, blew my mind at the time because those are things I used to do regularly. But, you know, through the course of life and because the job got so busy and the parents got me busy, I, all that took me away from what I used to do. And so I realized it was just time now to get back to, you know, doing those healthier habits again. So I did. I adopted those. Um, I adopted sauna. I started doing a deep dive into things that would benefit health or take away from health. And, of course, diet and processed foods was one of those things that I was not paying that much attention to. I thought I had a good diet, relatively speaking, you know, as far as what everybody in the world assumes is a good diet. Once I started doing this deep dive and realizing that the processed foods and all the additive ingredients, and the, um, the preservatives, the food colorings, you know, all those things really add up. And so I started slowly taking those things out of my diet, eating more just clean vegetables, fruit, grass-fed beef, you know, all organic stuff. Of course, I didn't do that all overnight. It, it took a while to you know, slowly change things out. And of course, since I was the one buying the food and bringing it home and you know, getting it from my parents, there was a lot of pushback from them because I was, I was changing what they were comfortable with and uh, they were not having it. So there was a lot of arguing there with me trying to get them on a much more healthier course. So I had to do it in baby steps, you know, boil the frog slowly in, in their case. So that you asked about the telomeres. That was my, that's my telomere story. So at the time in 2012, there really wasn't anything um, that could lengthen telomeres. It was just, you know, stop shortening them by stress. Um, since then, I think it was probably maybe 2015, 2016. I could be wrong on the timing, but I learned about um, something called telomerase. I guess it was through the course of studying cancer cells. They realized that cancer cells can basically be immortal because they produce their own telomerase. So their telomeres never shorten. And so in studying that, scientists figured out how to create telomerase activators. And so one of the first products I heard about for that was um, TAM818, which is fairly controversial 
um, supplement because the studies for it really, I guess, are not that robust. But there's a lot of claims that it, it can do what they say it can do, which is increase telomere length. And things like TA65, that's another another product. I take both of those. I also take Gatu Cola. Those are the three main things that are supposed to drive, well, and ashwagandha. Those are the four main things that are supposed to drive you know, telomere length extension. And so I do all of those. And I've been noticing from my testing that my telomeres have been getting longer. I've seen now that my telomeres are more in line with a 53-year-old. So I've reversed that from 68 back to 60, back to 53. And of course, they that varies too. I, I, after being sick, like the month of December, January, and February with uh, some type of flu, I don't know if it was COVID, I have no idea. I, I tested again immediately, my true diagnostic right after that, because I wanted to see. So that was probably dumb on my part because I didn't realize at that point that they were going to be averaging our test scores. So here, instead of testing at my best, I began testing at my worst because I wanted to see the impact the worst would actually be. So after being sick those three months and taking the, uh, the true diagnostic test, I think my pace of aging went up to, um, uh, it went up from 0.66 to 0.77 maybe. It went up fairly, fairly high from being sick those three months. And then I think my telomeres shortened again i'm gonna guess right now because i don't have the numbers in front of me but i think it went up to like a 58 year old instead of a 53 year old and then i was in italy for 30 days and i went on a completely different diet than what i'm on normally so when i was in italy i decided to you know do like the romans do and just do what everybody did i didn't take any of my supplements with me so i was off my supplements for 30 days i at home i eat very low carb i'm basically no sugar and no caffeine. But while I was in Italy, I was very high carb, very high sugar and high caffeine. So, you know, we do the, uh, the double espressos or the cafe doppios, you know, every, every afternoon that was really to combat the, the carb food. Cause you'd hit the carb highs and then you do the carb crashes after that. So you'd have to do the double espresso to pep yourself back up again. And of course, you can't just have a double espresso without doing a cornetto with cream, right? So you're doing the, the pastry along with the caffeine. And so you get that nice sugar rush and you're good for a little bit again until the next crash. So, you know, by then you're, you're ready to eat again and do more carbs. So I did the roller coaster the whole time I was there. I had terrible sleep. And so immediately when I got home, I blood tested again and I did another true diagnostic test. And uh, I think at that point, my pace of aging went up to... Um, 0.8. So, you know, it obviously had an effect and uh, my blood markers were not good as expected. My testosterone took a huge nosedive. Uh, it went down to 78 from about 900 down to 78. Yeah, you gained weight? <laughs> no, I'm talking about my, my testosterone level it went down. Yeah, from... but you, you oh, ate I... a lot of pasta, therefore you gained weight and your testosterone, despite that, went down and not up. Surprisingly, my weight really didn't change that much, but I had visceral belly fat that I could grab. So I lost muscle mass, but I did gain belly fat. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things I, I did when I got home after doing the testing, I did a a prolonged five-day fast. Normally, I do those do as a complete body reset. I like do eating nothing but water. What? Well, the, the prolonged fast is a fast mimicking diet, so it, it comes to you in a kit. Protein. It's like a giant shoebox, and then within the shoebox, there's five separate boxes, and each one of those boxes is a day, and in there, it will contain like um, soups, nut bars. There's about six to 800 calories a day that you, you consume of the foods that are provided. And that's divided up between like a breakfast, a lunch, a snack and dinner. So it, it mimics a fast just because it's you know, so calorically restricted that your body thinks that you're fasting, but at least you're getting mm -hmm. some food. So you're not like just want ready to chew your arm off. And typically in doing those, I'll, I'll lose eight pounds on average if I'm doing nothing but sitting. If I'm active during one of those fasts, I'll lose up to 12 pounds. So I thought, well, this would be a good time. I'll do a full body reset. I'll lose a little weight and, um, and I'll be good to go. So 
I did that. I lost the belly fat in the, in the five days. That was nice and quick. I did the reset. I did, um, I think I did another blood test shortly after that. And I got to see my blood markers all come back to baseline again. So it was, it was a fascinating experiment. Again, had I known that the rejuvenation Olympics was going to change the rules and do an average rather than your best pace of aging, I never would have tested in those worst of times. So that's really dinged my average score. Well, that's value capture for you because this is a wonderful example how games are changing your motivation. So if there are, if there is no game, then what you're going to do is that you're testing to know the result. But when game is introduced, now you are going to test when you are getting good result, right? right. <laughs> and then I wouldn't really um, be learning anything. I would just be competing. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Mm -hmm. um, what did you say? So what are the three things that you're, you're taking, trying to increase uh, making your telomeres longer? Go to cola, ashwagandha, and... And then the other two are products. One is a product by Bill Andrews. It's called Tam 818. And it's, it's really a derivative of ashwagandha. And then um, TA65 is another product that's available. I think it's also a derivative of ashwagandha. I tested, I tested pretty badly with my telomeres as well. And uh, I want to make them longer as well. Uh, for whatever that worth. Um, there was another person here, um, Stephen Shore. He's, he's into, well, he's unlike all the other Rejuvenation Olympics people I interviewed. He's more into this, uh, all kind of traditional herbal medicines, traditional Chinese, traditional Indian, traditional Schweizer, whatnot. And, He's like a master of medicine, some kind of guru, or I, I don't know. And he, he was showing, flexing that, oh, I have telomeres like a baby. <laughs> <laughs> and he's saying it's because of his protocol. Yeah. Yeah. So I ordered the, his telomere stuff and I'm going to test it. That is it really going to work? Because it, what he's, what he's putting in, at least the telomere is whatever is, is just normal some 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 herbs some some stuff that you can get anyway so you know i, I looked into his product because i watched your your youtube on him and i don't remember it doesn't say how much is it in <laughs> yeah it doesn't it didn't say how much it was it didn't uh i think it listed some of the ingredients i thought well some of those ingredients are some of the he, he says the ingredients yeah 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 and they sounded like very similar to what i'm already taking so i didn't know oh, yeah. if I want to duplicate that. If it's cheaper, I might be willing to do that. But I mean, the whole, the TAM 818 that I'm taking right now is crazy expensive. And I'm probably done taking that now because I think I got out of it what I wanted. So, I mean, now that my telomeres are at least younger than I am, I'm happy. I don't know if they need to be like a baby's. Um, like what, whatever that definition of like a baby's actually is, I'd be curious to know, but yeah, I think I can probably stop taking that now and save that money, but I, you know, I'd be interested in trying his product. I'm a consummate, you know, explorer and things like this. I love to experiment and try different things. So I might give it a shot. You'll have to let me know what well, you think. I, I got my, 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 my true diagnostic test. So whenever three months passed taking his telomere stuff, I will report back to you if I'm, if I'm a baby already or <laughs> not. You mentioned network security engineer. That was your, that was your trade. That was your craft. Um, what, what, what is it exactly? So, so I'm a soft, I am a software developer and, and I, I know these things, but I assume you were doing some things before my time. Um, so, so what, what did a network security engineer um, do in your time? Mm. Um, well, actually I've done a lot of things even, like I said, prior to that, I was an application developer, um, programmer. In what languages? Or, oh gosh, so many languages that probably don't, well, nobody's heard of anymore, oh, yeah. exist, but primarily um, C, C++, I mean, that people have least heard of. Ah, okay. APL, PL1, 
Lisp, Ada, Pascal, ASIC, BASIC still around, I believe, um, COBOL, Model 204. That was a, a database mostly used by the government and by the company that I worked for at the time. It's a fully relational database. It's got its own operating system and its own application language. And so I did a lot of work in that performance tuning of the OS, the database, and the applications. Yeah, so a, a lot of things. So I did uh, okay. wide area networking. And then when I, once I got into the uh, security aspect of it all, it was mostly firewalls and proxy servers. But uh, checkpoint firewalls, Cisco firewalls, Fortinets, I'm trying to think of what else. Yeah, I mean, there's so many different brands of things out there. All right, so tell me about your hacking career. Ah, <laughs> you know I actually have a hacking career. That's good to know. I was what, high school. What career. hat were you? Uh, a gray hat. <laughs> okay. I wasn't really a black hat, but well, all right. So in high school, um, I figured out how to hack into our county's data center. And it was the data center that housed like all of the grades for all of the schools in our our county. And I was able to look at grades. I was actually able to change students' grades. And I didn't dare do any of that because if they had found somebody had changed that, there was only a couple of students that were capable of doing that. And I was probably, you know, one of the three that they would have looked at. So um, it wouldn't have been too hard to figure out who it was. But yeah, I figured out how to hack into that based on a uh, application that was commonly used by students to figure out their, um, their potential employment direction. It was... <laughs> I'm going to admit all this. This is kind of embarrassing now. So there was a program called the Michigan Occupational Information System. And it was a, a program designed for students to sit down in front of a CRT screen in our library. In fact, most high school libraries. And it was a series of questions that it would take you through. And based on your answers, it would direct you to what you might be best uh, applicable to as far as a job in the future. And I had, I had an hour of free time, and so I volunteered to run students through this particular program. And more often than not, people would sign up and then not show up for their sessions. So I would have time to kill. And being a programmer myself, I knew that you know there were certain certain things because that you, I can, you, yeah, <laughs> because I can, yeah. I, I realized that by importing certain values when other values might have been expected, that the programmer may not have done good error testing. And um, yeah, so through the course of that, I was able to break out of the executing program and then be at the heart of the operating system where I could go anywhere and do anything I wanted to. And so I did, and I explored a lot. And, um, you know, after a while, I, I started finding games on there. I mean, all kinds of interesting things that people were working on. Somebody was working on a Star Wars simulation. So it was a little, it wasn't, wasn't necessarily graphic. It was more text-based because everything was text-based back then. And I played it for the longest time and it would, it would, it would bomb out at a, a certain point because whoever was working on it, I guess, couldn't get past whatever the problem was. And so I fixed it <laughs> because I wanted to play it. So I fixed it. And, um, and that, because I changed something, did attract somebody's attention, that somebody was in there that shouldn't have been in there. And I, the only way I knew that they started looking for me was because I was, a, I was a freshman at the time. There was a senior that was in one of my computer classes that worked for the, the county's data center. And he started telling me about this hacker that they were investigating and trying to find. And his description of this hacker made me laugh because I realized it was me that they were looking for. So he started like basically telling me everything that I had done. And I just kept my lip shut and I just kept listening. Like, oh, I was fascinated, like glued to his every word, you know, please do tell. So, <laughs> so while I was still out there exploring, I knew exactly what they were doing to be looking for me. So I avoided those things. Anyway, this, this went on for a very long time. And then uh, I, I eventually told him 
that it was me. And he didn't believe me because he was so arrogant. I mean, he just thought he knew so much more than I did. And, and maybe in some cases he did, but in this case, he didn't. Um, and so then I finally ended up having telling him things that I did that he had not told me. And, and then he believed me and he was shocked. Uh, but at that point, we were, he was graduating and he was gone, so it didn't really matter anyway. But yeah, so that system, several others. I mean, I'm in Detroit, so there's the big three automakers here. Uh, I was through most of their networks when I was still in high school, um, just because I could. You know, it, it was fun to see what you could get into. And all of that led me into my career in computer security because I, while I was learning how to do the various things that I was doing, I also wanted to find out, you know, what could easily be done to prevent somebody from doing these kind of things. But having said all that, it occurred to me even back then that the human body is like just a very larger and more complex machine and program. And so it got annoying to me in my job as a network security engineer to constantly be having to relearn new systems every couple of years when the company wiped what they did and came out with a whole new version. And then me having to be the expert, dive in and learn, you know, every little intricacy of that new system. It was fun. It was challenging, but it also got very old after a while because all that expertise would have to get thrown out and start over again from scratch even though some of the concepts would apply. But I realized that the human body is a, is a system that was designed once. It's never going to change. And if I put all my time learning into how the body works instead of learning how some you know, man-made system works, that would be a much better use of my time because it's more practical. And Interesting. we might learn things that uh, turn out to not be true. So at least I'm not having to throw away everything, but at least uh, I'm just having to just keep upgrading the knowledge as the knowledge improves. So I, I'm much happier now learning about the human body and the intricacies of that. It's interesting because I have a very similar journey here. So at, at one point in maybe around five years ago, for about, for about five years, I have been one of the most active software open source software developer in the world. Like, you know, I wake up and solving issues on GitHub and, and to the point where the top one, I was in the top 100, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, you get burned out and right now, and, and after that I built my company up and, and I just didn't have the, the opportunity to write a lot of code like back in the days, because now I have 50 people to to do something with, right? And that is not going to be me sitting down and coding as a technical CTO, CEO or whatever. So, 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 so why am I telling this? Is because, because I just, I just noticed something just today. I watched a video about, I think it was called sim.ai. You write, it creates websites for you based on based on based on text prompt and then you tell them that hey um change the color of this button or take this button to the other side or whatnot so you know that that is showing us something extremely important maybe we are not going to be um dive into in while and do while loops and 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 this kind of variable and that kind of variable but Maybe, 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 maybe this is going to be programming that you are talking to a computer like a normal person. And I mean, that, that must be the future here. It must I, be. I agree. I fear that programming is going to become a lost art because AI is going to do it all. We are biased, but there might be a, 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 an argument that our brain have developed in a way by writing a lot of code and trying to, to talk to people who are not writing any code to get their ideas into paper, into, into code that we might be able to talk to the machine much better, even with normal language, because we, we, we know what we want. 
<laughs> I, I like to think so too, but I don't know. <laughs> right, it might be our bias. Yeah. I hope you're okay. right. Okay, so a big topic, big topic. Everyone is the hero of their own story. What is your story? Wow, that's pretty all encompassing. There's so many different directions I can go in with that. I don't think you've asked anybody else this question, have you? Because I don't remember this coming up in any of your other podcasts. Different forms, different mm -hmm. forms. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I know the answer to that. Uh, my story is continuing to unfold and I'm just, now I'm in a phase where I'm just following wherever it leads. I haven't, I can't say that I've got a plan. I, I think I always had a plan to some extent. You know, high school, I knew that I wanted to get into programming and computers, so I did. I followed that through college, got into that as a career. I wasn't necessarily always the smartest person, but I was always willing to outwork anyone else. And I think that made me the hero of my story in many cases, just because I, I never, well, all right, so that, that took me to something. I, instead of bragging, about what I could do, I usually like to just surprise people with what I did. So, I mean, there was, there was coworkers that would say, oh, well, you know, I'm going to do this. And they'd have a lot of talk and a lot of very bold, like, yep, this is what I'm going to do. And then they would never do it. And then in my case, I never talked about anything that I was working on. I just unveiled it when it was done and people would go, whoa, where did this come from? I mean, just like, out of left field and wow, you know, I liked, I liked wowing people with results. And I think I've been doing that most of my life with stuff. I know on other podcasts, I mentioned that as a kid, I was always an odd kid. I was told that I was an old soul because I looked at things differently than normal kids would look at things. I would look at things like an old person looking back because I learned, I learned that at a very young age that Someday you're going to be older. And when you get there, are you going to be where you want to be? Do you have a purpose? Are you going towards something? And then when you get there, can you look back and see all the steps that you took to get there? And did you do all the right steps? Did you miss any? Is there, there's things that you should have done that you didn't do and that you're going to regret. So I had those thoughts as a, at a very early age about being very, very deliberate and very particular about where I was going and what I was going to do. And to that end, I would look at a lot of adults and see what made them successful. So if it was relationships, what made for, what would make for a successful marriage or partnership with someone? Cause I would see people that would get along, like they were best friends you know, and just have just great relationships and others where they would bicker constantly at each other and just nag, 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 and seem like they didn't really like each other. You know, their eyes would roll whenever the other person would talk and they just seemed to just put up with each other. I thought, well, what is it that makes a good relationship work? And then those other relationships so antagonistic or, you know, financially, I would see families that were much better off than we were. We were not very well off, but we were average for my neighborhood and, you know, for the school and everybody else that I knew. But they were very, very wealthy families that obviously did certain things to get there. What were those things and why weren't we doing those things? And then, of course, the same thing for, you know, looking at people as they aged. Why is it that some people aged so gracefully and seemed so energetic and capable and smart and yet other people that were still much younger than them that were, you know, just really broken down, uh, not very clear of thought, needing a lot of assistance from other people. And so I wanted to know what it is that all these successful people thought to do that made them successful. And what were all the things that the not so success, successful people were doing that made them not successful? And then, of course, I tried to emulate as best as possible the things that I saw that were making people successful in those avenues of life. And so I've always tried to do those. And so even when it comes to, you know, my longevity, my health today, 
where I am today was based off of guesswork and a lot, like I said, patterning myself after what a lot of other people did before me and hoping that it was going to come to fruition to be what I expected it to be. And so like when it came to high school and doing a lot of partying, you know, smoking, getting into drugs and stuff, a lot of my friends did that. And I, you know, I didn't, didn't fault them for that or judge them for that. It just, it wasn't, it wasn't really my thing. I did go, I did go through a heavy uh, period of drinking for a very short period of time where a group of us would get together after school. Uh, one of the kids, older brothers would buy us a, a bottle of whiskey and then we'd go down to this little Creek and we'd pass the bottle around and we'd, we'd be drinking the whiskey and we'd do that till we got drunk and we threw up and we would do this, um, I don't know, a couple days a week. And then at one point, when the bottle started to go around, I, I had to honestly look at everybody and said, why are we doing this again? Is this supposed to be fun? Because all I ever do is go home and get sick. I'm not really having fun. And then everybody else is like, yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, what? Right. Why are we doing it? I mean, nobody thought to question it, right? Because it, it was the thing that you did because you thought that's what you were supposed to do because that's what cool older kids did. And so when I asked the question, Immediately, everybody's like, yeah, this is stupid. Why are we doing this? Let's, let's not do this. And we stopped. Huh. All it takes is one person to question. Interesting. And so I, I've tried to look at things, tried, because I've failed many, many, many times. I've tried to look at things that everybody else accepts as being just the way it's done. It's just what we do. It's what we're supposed to do. And question that and say, well, why? <laughs> why is that what we're supposed to do? Is that the right thing? And in questioning that, that's really helped me a lot to avoid a lot of pitfalls. But then in other cases, things were so ingrained, like the processed foods, you know, that was just so normalized that uh, it took me many, many, many years before I started questioning that and really doubting that this makes sense. Why are we, why are we eating this way? Why do we prepare our foods this way? I know fried foods taste really wonderful, but we know it's terrible for us. People love smoking. They know it's bad for them, but they still do it anyway. You know, the drinking. We know that that's not good for us long term. You know, it's fun. It's fun in the short term. No, we do it anyway. And so it's it's almost like there's this societal brainwashing that we're all involved in. We just accept it because that's what everybody does. And sometimes you've got to step out of the matrix and say, all right, you know, take that red pill or the blue pill. Say, which one is it going to be? Am I going to? keep doing what everybody's doing because this is comfortable. And by stepping out of that, I'm going to make myself different and I don't want to be different. I want to be just like everyone else. Or do I want the benefits of being different, of stepping out of that matrix, finding out what's really on the other side and how much better things can be. There's a famous finance guy by the name of Dave Ramsey. He has this saying, live like no one else so that you can live like no one else. And it's such a brilliant concept because it applies to so many more things than just finance. It definitely applies to health, fitness, longevity. If you live like no one else, eventually you will live like no one else. It's very profound. It reminds me of Guru, Guru strategies. When you're writing code and you have a problem that you cannot fix, then you can fire up some guru strategy generator that, or oh, have you tried to turn it upside down? <laughs> and then you start to think about it. Oh, if I turn it up, oh, that might work. Or this kind of uh, guru advices, you know, that <laughs> applies every, to every situation. Let's move on to, to religion. Feuerbach, projection theory, says that a believer's highest value is God. And the believer is projecting his highest value into God. So if I ask a believer that what God means to, to him, then he's probably going to say what's the most important to him, what's his highest value. So what does God mean to you? Hmm. When I look at the intricacies of, let's just say the human body, I mean, let's ignore for the moment the vastness 
of the universe and the, and the, the macrosphere or the infiniteness of the microsphere of looking into, you know, atoms and molecules and, and how everything is designed on those larger and, and miniature scales. And look at just the design of the body, how incredibly complex it is. Feedback systems upon feedback systems that we're still only, our best minds are only scratching the surface of understanding. There's no way, I, no way that in my mind that any of this could have been accidental, that it could have just happened. It's very, to me, it's very obviously designed. So who designed it? Someone, somebody, some group, something had to have designed all this to very specifically work the way it very specifically works. I just, I can't believe it's accidental. It's just impossible that this could be accidental. So to me, that's the very evidence that I need that there is a God. And I just, anybody that wants to dispute that can very easily say, oh, you know, it was all just um, accidental. It was just created out of nothing. It just happened. It evolved. I just, I don't, I don't see that happening. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but that's why I think it's you're, you're, you're posing a challenge. You're posing yeah. a challenge. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 98 percentile on the disagreeableness scale. So I guess I'm going to check myself and not going to take your bait <laughs> and go. <laughs> no, I mean, if you want to play devil's advocate, go for it. Cause you know what? I, I play devil's advocate all the time with myself. I will, sometimes I will take a completely opposite perspective from one that I'm very entrenched in. And I'll argue for that other perspective. And I've talked to myself out of some of my positions because of my reasoning on the opposite side, realizing, oh man, there's merit to that. So when I'm talking with friends that are very political, I drive them nuts because my conservative friends think or suspect that I'm liberal. My very liberal friends think or suspect that I'm conservative. I think of myself as a moderate because I, I tend to see the, the flaws in both the extremes. I, I do that What's on flaws? every- Oh, now you're really gonna get me in trouble. <laughs> um, I don't feel comfortable in getting into that on this podcast. Let's just say that um, nobody has a corner on morality. Nobody has a corner on being correct because both extremes have just gotten way too extreme. I can't agree with either of the extremes. I, I just, I think in our, in our country, we need to see people come back more toward the, toward the middle and work together and agree on the things that we can agree on and stop trying to push our very extreme agendas on each other. Like Live and let live. You could go between uh, vegans and um, carnivores, right? There's two extremes. Those work for those people. The vegan people are very happy be be being vegan, and the carnivores are very happy being carnivores. And it works for them. But trying to force a carnivore to be a vegan or force a vegan to be a carnivore, no, it's never going to work. And you can't make everybody agree. So we've got to be able to just coexist and to be able to do the things that work for us and, and not have to be forced into somebody else's point of view. Would you say, don't tread on me? <laughs> sure. Sure. That's it. That's it. Uh, are you a libertarian? I don't know if I could call myself that. Even when you get into diets, I don't, I couldn't call myself a vegan or paleo or a keto or a carnivore i'm a mix uh, i like to Are think you of a freedom myself. lover i am i am i like to think of myself more on the line well i mean this is this sounds egotistical because i'm not to this degree but i like to think of myself or try to think more in the ideology of bruce lee and that's pick the best of each and and synergize those because one system isn't necessarily the end all to be all. It's a combination of all of them. And if you if you're gonna go for the worst in all of them, you're just screwed. But if you pick the best out of all of them, that's the way to go. You see, I am not a libertarian, but of all the because I don't know enough of that, right? 
but of all the people, I think they make the most sense. And taxes are theft, most importantly. And the government is a violence organization. So let's 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 change topics. Who are you in daily contact with? So people say you are the person, uh, the average of the five people around you. So who, who's your tribe? I have a, a couple of very diverse tribes. Wow, interesting. Um, so I have a, a couple of really close high school friends that I'm still in touch with every day. We have a Facebook group, uh, Bill and Bob. Bob is on the West Coast and Bill is on the East Coast and I'm still here in Michigan. So we tend to see things differently from our various localities and perspectives, but we still have our same, you know, high school sense of humor. And so we still muse over a lot of things every day. I also have, like I said, my, my, my drinking group, which is kind of fun because, you know, some of them are in bands. So we like to go um, see the band, their bands play and we like to go to concerts and I have a running team. I have a church community. So my influences are very diverse and I like it that way. I have, again, friends that are very, very uh, staunch Republicans and other friends that are very staunch Democrats. And I learn a lot from listening to both of them and their perspectives. So maybe that makes me sort of a chameleon, but I think um, I enjoy people so much. I enjoy all of them. And just because they might believe something different from me doesn't you know, preclude our friendship. So um, yeah, I'm a product of all of those people that are in my life and I'm very grateful for that. Okay. Um, I didn't want to spend too much time on it because that's where you talk. You always talk about these things, right? Sleep, eat, pills, supplements, move, and so on. So, so, so I, I'd like to ask you to, 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 to keep it fresh and keep it new. Let's first start with your, your environment. What, what kind of environment are you existing in, in terms of, in terms of path optimization kind of environment? My environment. Well, I live in a smart home, which would shock a lot of people in the health industry because, oh my gosh, the EMFs, ah, they're everywhere. Um, and it's true. I've got a Amazon Echo Dot in every room. All of my lights are uh, Bluetooth enabled. All of my switches are uh, either Zigbee or Z-Wave. Yeah, I mean, really everything in this, this place is connected and, and programmed in some way. My lights come on and off at you know, pre-programmed times. They change colors at pre-programmed times. So they shift to red lights you know, toward the evening and then they dim progressively. Yeah, <laughs> but I also employ a lot of EMF mitigation strategies as well. So I have a, a blue shield cube, if you've ever heard of that. It, uh, it emits scalar waves, but in a signal that's supposedly strong enough to overpower any of the EMFs that are produced by any of my electronics so that my body is picking up more on the scalar waves, which are the natural waves of the earth, or the natural EMFs, I should say, of the earth. So that's, that's a mitigation. Um, right on the outside of this wall, I have a smart meter in my home. I know a lot of people are, you know, that are worried about EMFs are having smart meters removed from their houses. I instead, um, two, maybe three years ago now, I had the aluminum siding taken off the house and new vinyl siding put on for aesthetics. When I had that done, I employed multiple layers of EMF shielding fabric between the smart meter and my house. So that sorry, way, sorry, what is a smart meter? A smart meter would be an uh, electrical, electrical meter. So it measures, you know, how much electricity your, your home is consuming. And the smart aspect of it is it's got Wi-Fi built in so that the electrical company doesn't have to send someone out to read the numbers off the meter. They can just drive down the street and, and pick up the signal that's coming from your meter. So they produce very large mm -hmm. peaks or spikes of Wi-Fi signal. 
So with the shielding fabric between it and my house, it's not radiating the Wi-Fi signal into the home. It's reflected out. So that's that's a mitigation strategy that I adopted. Do, 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 you, do you think it matters? I don't, I don't know. I mean, honestly, I don't know. There's so many things that in the health and fitness space, whether it's, it comes down to vaccines or, you know, or I anything else. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, there's so many things that may or may not be true and I don't know. So I pretend like they're true as far as potential mitigations go, but then I also pretend like they're not true so that I'm not stressed and worried about it. I've had people ask me like, how can you eat fish now? Because there's so many microplastics in, in fish and they tell me they've given up all fish. I'm like, well, all right. So there may be microplastics in fish. Uh, we don't know to what degree. We don't know if it's in all fish. Maybe the smaller fish have less. I don't know. Uh, there's probably microplastics in everything. So if we avoided everything that has microplastics, there wouldn't be anything that we could eat. So I try not to let that steal my joy or, or for my mental uh, sanity. I have to pretend like these things don't exist. EMFs are everywhere. I mean, thanks to Elon, there's now, you know, satellites that are around the earth that are going to do 5G everywhere. Uh, there's no avoiding it. So we either uh, adapt or we die. And I like to look at those things EMF and 5G to some degree as hormetic stressors. They're, they, they could probably be stressing our body, but a little bit of stress is a good thing. Uh, too much stress is a bad thing. Whether it's a little or too much really depends on how healthy you may or may not be. Again, I just have to do my best to keep my body as healthy as possible so that if there are harmful effects from those things, that I'm shielded from that. Or I'm protected from that to some degree. Have you been fighting with carbon dioxide as well? Fighting with carbon dioxide? Well, I have been fighting with carbon dioxide, like how to keep my my place ventilated, mm. uh, not let the allergic pollen come in, right? So I cannot open a window in, in specific parts of the the, the summer and I, 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 many people have problems because plants do nothing, nothing at all. <laughs> and you cannot just put any anything in there. So purifiers don't take carbon dioxide. So, uh, uh, yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? I, I, I do now. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't sure before, but now I do. Um, we've had issues with where I live. I'm in Michigan, so the Canadian wildfires were, yes. were putting a lot of smoke, you know, down into Michigan and ruining the air quality for quite some time. And then there's ozone action alert days where the ozone is particularly high. And, you know, they tell you don't run gas powered lawnmowers and things like that and try to stay indoors. So, yes, I, to the best of my ability, I do those little things that I can do. I have house plants. I do grow my own plants, uh, like food plants in the basement under grow lamps. I'll do microgreens. I have things like... Um, oregano and rosemary and mint growing in my basement, among other stuff. Um, so I, the plants, to the degree that they can, are helping my, my air quality. I also have, there's, there's one right here, uh, an air doctor in every single room of my house. So it's an it's a air filter. Um, I, I do the same for my water. I have an AquaTrue. So I filter my water before I drink it. I even have one uh, a filter in my shower, on my shower head. So it takes out all of the um, the chlorine. Because I noticed before I got that, that uh, my hair would tend to get very dry. My skin, my face, everything would, would really dry out after a shower. But since I, I put the filters on, my skin quality has improved a lot. So yeah, there's a lot of things like that in my home that I try to mitigate for the exposures okay okay that's 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 good to know because i found that many many rejuvenation athletes don't do do these things um and i'm glad again, you the only 
nobody's asked me that so far in any any podcast. So I'm glad you asked. <laughs> yeah, I've I've done a lot myself. So I I, I hope you know circadian lighting and, and lighting and stuff should should make a difference. Should make a difference. One one thing I I started to do, and I I think you are doing doing similar things to stock a bunch of things that I have no idea if they do anything together because I can <laughs> uh, like every morning I wake up and, and and after the bathroom stuff I come to the computer and I I put on electric muscle stimulator light uh, blue light this light everything what I I can like okay so what is the largest stacked together things that you're doing. All right. So for instance, the first thing I do when I wake up while I'm still in bed, at the very bottom of my bed, I have a magnetico um, magnetic pad. It's like a 20 Gauss system. It's basically thousands and thousands of little magnets. Supposedly, according to Dr. Jack Cruz, that supposedly it's uh, the magnetic field from that is supposed to be helping my physiology. Not exactly sure how or if it really does do what it's claimed to do, but but I have one, so I'm, I trust in that. And a further up layer on my bed, I have a, a PEMF mat. It's called a Beamer. It's got scientific evidence to prove that it helps with blood flow to uh, the, the small capillaries. And it helps blood flow more efficiently through the body. And then just above that, I have my eight sleep. So it, it keeps the bed cooled or, or heated however I need. Just above that, I have a grounding earthing mat. So that's that's connected to the ground. So I'm always grounded while I'm in bed. And then you know, above that, I have my regular my regular sheets. So while I'm in bed, before I get out of bed, the first thing I do is I turn on the beamer and I'll do a, a beamer session. And I have my Nano V also right next to the bed. And if I didn't have the Nano V going with a cannula all night long, I will turn it on when I wake up and I'll put the cannula in and I'll be breathing the, the, the mystic, mystified air that comes out of that. And that helps with protein folding, oxidative stress. Uh, a lot of top athletes use that. I'm using it right now because it's the only uh, mitigation I know that addresses the whole um, loss of proteostasis as far as those um, hallmarks of aging goes. So I'll be breathing that, doing the PEMF session, and stretching. So I'll be doing my legs stretched over my head or, or one leg over my head with the other leg straight out. I'll be doing my morning stretching. So that's that's one stack of multiple things that I'm assuming are doing good things for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's later. I'll do the Carol bike, and while while I'm doing the Carol bike, I have my Juve panel that's behind me. So the Juve is has lit me up. And the Juve is, does what? It's a it's a red light panel, infrared. Red light. So yeah, a regular infrared and near infrared. And then when I'm in my sauna, I have a, a clear light infrared sauna. While I'm in there, I also included four, I guess they would be, I'm sorry, it's a far infrared sauna. I included four near infrared floodlights. So I'm getting near, far, and regular infrared treatment while I'm in the sauna. And I'm listening to podcasts or I'm meditating or I'm watching Netflix. So it, it depends. So I'll be stacking those, those things together. I like to do more than one thing at a time always so if i can yeah. find ways to stack things together to save time i, I definitely will yeah this is uh, well this is the hacking mindset right <laughs> yeah so while i'm talking to you right now this is one of the few times that i don't have a podcast or a youtube video going i almost always have like from the time i wake up to the time i go to bed i'm listening to either a podcast an audible book or watching a youtube video constantly trying to learn more things Okay, let's let's talk about that because that seems a bit hmm, distracting. I noticed that I cannot decide when I'm doing the bathroom stuff, you know. 
while I'm brushing my teeth, should I be listening or should I be present? You know, it's, it's, it's always like, uh, that is the, that is the perfect time when I cannot decide. It's like, okay, if I go to a sauna, sure, I'm listening to something. If I'm doing cardio, I'm listening to something. But when I'm doing something that I'm doing every day, but still I need some presence. Now that's when I'm, I'm like, well, I, I don't know. So, so what's your philosophy? Didn't you notice some problems here? You know, I find for a lot of things like brushing teeth, I can do it completely on autopilot showering. I can, I can still shower and listen to a podcast. I mow the lawn while listening to a podcast. How, how, do, you, how do you listen to a podcast where the shower is pretty oh, um, loud? Just because I have my, my phone right here. I have a magnet on the back of the phone and there's a magnet glued to the tile in the shower. So this is usually stuck to the wall, the opposite side from the shower head. So it's right in the shower with me and it's quite loud. So I can hear it just fine. Oh, wow. Okay. That's good. That's smart. Okay. Yeah. I have a, another magnet just like this on my juve panel. So I stick it to the hat. I have one in my sauna. So actually <laughs> the one in the sauna doesn't work because the phone overheats. So I have to leave the phone outside of the sauna, but the sauna has oh, yeah. a Bluetooth speaker inside. So I just listen to it through the Bluetooth speaker instead. So that works fine. <laughs> Um, when I'm out mowing the lawn, I'll I'll throw on headphones. So I'll put the headphones on. I can. It's an electric lawnmower, so it doesn't make much noise anyway. But the noise canceling headphones make it even easier. And then again, driving yeah. my car, you know. So there's a lot of things I can. I've I've practiced a lot doing two things at once like that. So it's not usually an issue. I can't. And I cannot write. I can't write something and listen. I cannot code. So I can't be working on a program and listen. My brain just doesn't allow for that. I, it's one or the other, but I can't do both in those, in those cases. What, what about what about thinking? It's it's not that I'm brushing my teeth and listening. It's like I'm brushing my teeth and listening, but I should be thinking what's the next thing that I'm going to do. Sometimes, not all the time, right? Like. That's the problematic. So that, that, that's interesting. Well, that's a good question. I can answer that though. Um, so most of the podcasts that I'm listening to, they're not groundbreaking new things. So many of them are conversations like we're having. Oh. And, and it's very easy to task switch between thinking of things and still listening where I'm not necessarily giving it my full 100% attention. If I hear something, that captures my attention, like, oh, wait, that was a new concept, or what did they just say? Or that was a product I'm not familiar with. Then I'm like, whoa, okay, I'll slow it down from 2.5 or three times normal speed, which is what I typically listen to things at, down to, you know, 1.5 or just regular two times normal speed so I can still really focus on what they're saying um, and then stop everything else that I'm doing and give it my undivided attention. But most of the time, it's not deep or new mm -hmm. new things. So I can easily shift my mind into what I have to do next and go back to the podcast and still sort of be listening to it in the back of my mind. Does that make I sense? I see. I see. Makes, makes perfect sense. You're the, you're the two X listener type. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm the listener type that stops and rolls back all the time. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm slowing myself down. I do that too, when I have to. Yeah. And um, I didn't just start listening at those fast speeds. I mean, it's just gradually just kept increasing and, and still on. Some podcasts, the speakers speak really slow. So I can mm -hmm, easily mm -hmm. do it at three times normal speed and still understand them just fine. You know, where others are fast talkers. So maybe only two, two X is the best I can get. Sleep. Uh, I can imagine you're doing so many things with sleep that how can I ask about something, something, something valuable, something, something surprising. Is there something surprising you're doing for sleep? You know, I've, I have tried all of the sleep hacks that um, I've heard people like Dave Asprey or Ben Greenfield or really just about anyone that have recommended sleep hacks. I think I've tried them all and some have worked for me 
but only for a very short time and then stopped working at all. Or we'll have a very specific effect. Like, for example, at one point, just taking um, peptides, uh, collagen peptides before bed really made a big difference. All of a sudden I was sleeping terrifically. I don't know if I had some sort of deficiency in collagen peptides, if that's even a possible possibility. Um, but but doing them really profoundly impacted my sleep for the best. But then that didn't last very long, and then it didn't seem to have any effect anymore at all. I can take things like um, ketones, like liquid ketones, like ketone IQ before bed, and I will have really interesting lucid dreaming. So I, if I want to particularly have a lucid dream. At night, I will do some ketones before bed, and it's kind of fun to play with. You can also put some nicotine patches on you. <laughs> ah, interesting. I tried that. Well, maybe I'll have to give mm. that a shot. Hmm. Okay. Um, gosh, what else? I found, though, it seems to me now for the best sleep, just doing nothing seems to work great. I, I did my, uh, I had to redo my bedroom because I, I had a lot of junk light coming in from the outdoors. So now that I have blackout curtains and I sleep with a sleep mask and I've taped off just about every LED in the room, which there are a lot of, now that my room is super dark and I keep it really cold, I sleep quite well. And right now I'm going through a, a course of um, CJC 1295 with ipamorelin. Uh, it's a growth hormone secretagogue. It's a peptide. And in doing that right now, um, my sleep has been amazing. So I've, I've gotten like my first 100s on my whoop in a, in a very long time, thanks to that. That's not a question again. But what, what have you not talked about? What have people not asked you about your, your eating habits before that you would, would like to share well i'm i'm not caloric restricted people like to compare me to brian and brian is caloric restricted someone else pointed out to me that maybe i am i'm just unintentionally caloric restricted because i don't count calories at all I could, I could care less about calories i just eat until i'm full and i eat like a horse I, when i go out to restaurants with friends they laugh because i order two meals not just one. I order two meals and I'll typically finish what everybody else has on their plates if they have anything left over. Because I eat, I eat really big, but that might be the, the only meal I'm going to have then for that day. If we're, if we're out early in the day, I'm not going to eat a dinner then at that point because I'm satiated for the day. But I will eat a breakfast, which is my chia nut berry bowl. And how I, what's in that and how I do that is on my website uh, along with everything else that I eat. Most of the time I'm so busy that I don't even stop to take time for lunch. I don't even think about food. And it, it's often late into the evening when I realize I haven't eaten. And so I have to set an alarm for myself or make a note to myself to eat dinner at 3 or 4 p.m. because I like to be done eating by 5. And I found on my sleep tracking my, for my scores, I sleep a lot better when I'm not digesting food. So if I've got at least three, maybe even four hours before my last meal and bed, it's much better on my sleep scores. Exactly, I found the exact same thing. Um, actually, I'm living, I'm living, I'm a slave to my calendar and to my reminders. So when do I eat? When do I do anything? I, I always have a reminder. Um, anyhow, let's move on to One more supplement. thing. Before we do, one more thing I'd like to say about that. It kind of makes sense that that would be better off for our health, not just for the scores of the sleep. Because when you're sleeping is when your body is doing its major repairs. And if you're digesting a big bolus of food, it's in your stomach, your blood supply, all of your bodily functions are being focused on digesting that food. So you're stealing that, those processes away from your body doing its healing and repair. So again, that's why it's important, not just for a score on a sleep tracker, but you know, for your, for your body's benefit. Sorry, the lights automatically turned off on me again. So 
Um, <laughs> there we go. Um, Smart. For your, for your body's benefit, yeah, because it's like afternoon, I would be out somewhere, so there's no reason for the lights to be on. For the body's benefit, it's best not to be distracting it with having to digest stuff. So I just wanted to add that in. It, it, it's interesting for me. I'm always either on a huge diet and I'm losing a lot of weight or I'm gaining a lot of weight up. So in the last five years, I, I'm like every two, every year, two or three times, I lose 10 kilograms and I gain back 10 kilograms. So it's a, uh, uh, right now I'm losing 10 kilograms. So it's right now I'm on the good. <laughs> I'm, I'm eating clean. I, I'm not smoking. I'm everything. But uh, it could be even if I could a line of work. Yeah. You could sit so long, right? Yeah, yeah. You know that you sit um, for many hours a day. I I had that problem. So 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 not 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 anymore. But but even even when I did, it was. Um, I was actually traveling around the world in Asia. So, so I, ha I, I went to almost every single day I worked in a new place and therefore new kind of chair, new, sometimes I was standing while working. That, there was always some, some difference. So, so I, I didn't have that kind of problem. Like, like normal programmers are suffering from the chair and monitor yeah i would have Does, to but, arm like every 15 minutes or every 30 minutes to go get up and do an exercise snack like just go get up go into the kitchen i've got a chin-up bar you know in the hallway and i'll do some chin-ups or just go do some push-ups and and come back and go back to coding again or just go I, run down the street and run right back just a nice quick sprint and then right back that that is crazy that's that's so bad you you know, if a programmer is interrupted, then he's losing 15 minutes, even if the interruption only takes two seconds. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, you're killing your productivity. I don't know, but, you know, because I find sometimes like when I'm out on one of those sprints and I come back, it gets the blood flowing and my brain is so much clearer. You know, even after mm -hmm. I've done a, a bunch of the chin-ups or the push-ups, my heart is pumping, the blood's flowing. I, my thought process seems so much more clear when I come back to the keyboard. Because if I don't, okay, okay. I, I'll see, I'll find myself sitting for, like if I'm in the flow, when I'm programming, I get in the flow state, I can sit for four, five, six hours without getting up, without eating, without going to the bathroom. And all of a sudden realizing, oh man, I've been here for, <laughs> wow, I need to go, I need to go do something today because I've just been here coding. So I'll lose all track of time if I don't set those alarms and reminders to get up and go do something. Yeah, you know, I have a gymnastic ball and a kneeling chair. Mm -hmm. So, and I keep changing them every, every day. I use a little bit of gymnastic ball, a little bit of kneeling chair and a little bit of normal chair. So that's, uh, that seems to work pretty well. Yeah. I like that. Okay. Okay. Supplements. So I don't even want to go into what kind of supplements you're taking. I will ask about one, maybe two, but but I am more interested in a in a more meta meta issue here. So f firstly, just give me a number. How many pills do you take a day? You know, I'm I'm gonna have to consult my own website on that because it doesn't have to be accurate. <laughs> because you know, stuff like that to me is is trivia. I don't keep it in my brain because. You know, I, it's just taking up space. So I'll, I have to refer to my own website most of the time for everything. Even when I'm like packaging up my vitamins to know what it is or my supplements, I should say, to know what it is that I'm taking, I'll refer to my own website because I don't keep all that in my head. I, I know why I take it when I add it in, but then it's gone. It's just part of a routine and I don't have to even give it any um, mental energy after that. This is, I'm currently taking about 130 individual supplements per day. That's over 170 capsules per day. There's currently 83 in the morning and 96 in the evening. And of those, it's about 107 are pill type supplements and the other 20 are in powdered forms that I mix with drinks. Now that varies. That was as of when I packaged up my vitamins for the month last month. Um, 
I'm always adding and removing things into my supplement stack based on uh, the experiment that I'm trying with it at the time to see, is it doing anything for me? Is it beneficial? Is it moving any of the markers that I'm working on right now in my blood labs? So if it's a, if it's a longevity thing or it's like for my telomeres, those are pretty much always consistent, even though I'm probably going to drop the, the TAM 818 now that I've gotten to where I want to be. Um, but, but many other things are being experimented in and removed back out again. So it's, it's just a constant flux. So what I want to ask you about is your logistics here. How do you, how do you, do you have a peel prep session <laughs> every month, every week? I, I, um, yeah. What about keeping truck and, and buying these things? I, I assume you would even have to keep track of how much you are taking and keep the changes. So there are some logistical problems with, with, with this. Oh, Tell yeah. me about that. Oh, yeah. Um, I recently, like within the last um, within the last few weeks, I added a section on my website to explain that and show some pictures. So, yeah, one of the things I do, in fact, I think I've got one here somewhere. Okay. This isn't one of the ones that I typically use because the ones I typically use are clear. But as an example, this would be one day's one worth day. of supplements. Yeah. So Sunday, Monday, Tuesday are the morning supplements. This would Wednesday would be the afternoon supplements, if there are any. And then Thursday, Friday, Saturday would be the evening supplements. And typically, each one of these can contain about 30 pills. Three? And then 30, 30. 30, ah, okay, okay, okay. And so when I'm taking them, I can usually swallow about 15 at a time. So... Mm -hmm. That's two swallows, two swallows, so six swallows in the morning to get my morning supplements in. And I'll, I'll typically take those with something like V8 juice or a smoothie. It has to be thick because if I try to get this down with water, I'll, I'll gag, I'll choke. It, it'll, I can't, can't do that. So something thick like a V8 juice works perfect. It just helps everything just slide right on down. So I'll have a stack of these that I'll fill for the month because I don't want to be going through this process every week. It's a big pain. It takes me about two, two and a half hours to segment out all of my supplements for the month. And I've got underneath my bed, I have a, um, I think you call it a, it's like a, it's a plastic bin. It's very flat, shallow, but it's long. I think more, it's like a, a garment, a garment holder but I keep all of the active supplements that go in here in that. And then each, I don't even have a good example, but on the top of every one of my supplements, I'll have a sticker and the sticker will say, you know, it's one M like for one morning or two M if I'm supposed to take two in the morning um, and one E for evening. And I, with that, I don't even have to look and see what the supplement is that I'm putting in the container. I just know how many of them need to go in which which section so that makes it really quick because there's no examining of oh i gotta read uh, read this and say oh i have to take these many no i just look at the cap and put that many in my hand and that many go into the containers and then this chest of drawers right over here every one of these drawers contains supplements there's no there's no clothes in these <laughs> so that's my storage that's my stock of the things that i'm using and multiple, multiple copies of. And so when I run low in that plastic bin that's underneath my bed, I'll go grab another one out of here and replace that, if that makes sense. So that's the, the yeah. logistics of the larger storehouse versus the active supplements versus then what gets put in this for the month to use. And then as I'm pulling out of here, I can see when I'm getting low on something and then I'll go in order it on life extension or Amazon or wherever I'm getting that particular supplement from. Okay. 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 Nice. Nice. It's a, uh, it's interesting how, how was, as the number of supplements grow, these things get, <laughs> things become a problem <laughs> that you wouldn't think would right. ever be a problem. I just yeah. saw a, a friend of mine taking six 
appears it's like one by one you know yeah. <laughs> i'm like looking at you what are you doing man so i teach him how to do it properly <laughs> julie gibson clark her father was your what 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 was her father to you he was he was kind of a hero to me when i was 12 maybe i had posters of the skylab and apollo astronauts on the wall in my room my bed my bedroom in talking to julie when i realized that she mentioned her dad was an astronaut and i'm like wait your dad was ed gibson she's like that's my dad and i'm like oh my gosh i'm like what are the odds that i would be talking to somebody whose you know picture i had on the wall when i when i was a kid just blows my mind so i thought that was pretty cool and julie's a very yeah. fun person i enjoy talking with her we often message on uh instagram and uh yeah she's just really really cool she does something that i had never heard of before and that's cooking your greens before putting them in a smoothie and i thought that's brilliant why have i never thought of that i've always just done my greens raw and blended them but i know that when you cook things you can change the chemical structure like you know taking tomatoes and getting lipo lycopene out of tomatoes when they're cooked. Yeah, it brings a whole different array of nutrients out of them when you're cooking them. So that's something that I I told her that I'm going to try to incorporate into my routines is, is cooking my greens. I haven't done it yet just because it takes me a while to formulate new habits and make it so that they are a habit. And I haven't found a way to work that into my my current habits yet, but it's, it's on my radar. It's on my plan. I'm definitely going to do that because I think it's really smart. You know, she could, she could get a pretty good job at some billionaire who would like to eat healthy, <laughs> you know, yeah, for sure. Um, which other athletes do you know? I know Jen Vell. I know yeah, she's a very interesting person. Yeah. I know you've talked oh, to her. Yeah. Um, I, I, have spoken with Dr. Michael Lusgarden. So um, we've not met in person yet, but we've been messaging a lot for the past couple of months, trying to think who else. Um, but I'm not missing anyone obvious. Oh, well, Seam Land, I did a, a podcast with him. So we've met over you know, Riverside and um, he's a fascinating guy. I'm hoping to meet Brian someday, but other than that, I think, I think that's all. Oh, and Julie and Diane or, and I were going to do a, we're, we're going to do a group call, but then that got canceled because Diane got busy. Um, so I'm hoping that'll happen because I'd really like to meet her too. Took me, took me months for Diane. Diane booked, answered right away, but booked for a couple of months later. So oh, <laughs> she must wow. be pretty busy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that was um, one of the reasons I joined the rejuvenation Olympics in the first place is because I thought. I thought based on the tagline on the website was that they're going to crowdsource longevity. So to me, that meant that, wow, okay, they're going to get all of the people that are in this top 10 or even the top 20, get us all together and form a mastermind group and try to find out what is it that we're all doing in common or what are things that, you know, other people are doing and getting better results but doing it more simply than like what I'm doing. And that would be awesome. How much we could learn from each other from that. That's what I expected was going to happen with the rejuvenation Olympics. And then I was really disappointed to see that that never happened, that Brian never got anybody together. And instead his answer seemed to be do what I do, follow my N of one, eat my nutty pudding and do my, my green drink and buy my products. And I was seriously disappointed by that because I just thought that was a really big missed opportunity. So I'm glad that you are doing what you're doing by bringing us all together. And that's why I reached out and found Jen Vell and Julie. And uh, well, they were the only two people I could find on Rejuvenation Olympics. So I'm glad there's somebody like you that went out and actually did locate many, many more people and are in a roundabout way, bringing us all together so that we can learn from each other. Like I hoped we would have done in the 
to begin with. That's that's interesting. I took a note of that. Maybe I somehow try to create a common forum after I interviewed enough people to have some good crowd there. It's, um, thanks. Thanks for the idea. Um, okay. Now let's switch things up. There is a question I ask from everyone, but you know the question already because <laughs> I, you have seen my podcast before. So I would like you to ask the question to yourself and answer it. Go. So the question is, if I'm a contrarian, basically, what is it that I believe that other people don't? Is that, or, or probably would disagree with? Is that the question you were thinking of? The value lies where you know something that other people do not, or and other people think differently. So how do you think differently? What is the thing where you think different? So the one that I alluded to in the beginning, that our pace of aging is really based on what we remove rather than what we're adding or what we're doing. So that's that's something that I think that most people are, are not picking up on. If you want to improve the pace of aging, stop doing all the, the foods that we're normally eating, all of the processed foods, and start eating more natural stuff because that'll eliminate a lot of the things that I think are aging us artificially. That's one. Another, I mean, there's so many. I'm, I'm a natural skeptic on everything. When I try a new thing, I try it to prove that it doesn't work. So when it does work, I'm always pleasantly surprised. Something like testosterone replacement. That's something that it kind of irritates me because I don't think it's really necessary for a lot of people. I find that most of my friends are on testosterone replacement hormone. And I'll ask them if their doctor ran a full hormone panel on them. And they'll say, oh yeah, they, they checked my testosterone and it was low. And I'm like, no, not just your testosterone. What were your other hormones? What was your pregnenolone? What was your progesterone? What was your DHEA? And they're like, oh, I don't know that. And they don't think they even ran that. And they'll show me their labs and they're not on their labs. And... <laughs> It frustrates me because, well, my testosterone is really high and I don't take any testosterone replacement hormone. Instead, I focused on the fact that my DHEA was lower than it should be for a 25-year-old athlete. Same with my pregnenolone. Pregnenolone is an upstream precursor of both DHEA and testosterone and estrogen. So by supplementing with pregnenolone and to some degree even DHEA, you are going to increase your testosterone and your estrogen naturally. So without having to get stuck in a para another paradigm of the uh, medical model that we have today, where they want, they love to get you addicted to a prescription, right? Because you'll be a customer for life on that prescription. We're now doing that with testosterone replacement. You know, people or doctors are just going directly to, we're going to give you a, a, you know, either an injection that you're going to do every day, or you're going to do weekly, or we're going to, you know, we're going to put a pellet in your butt, whatever it is, you are now going to be tied to this for life because you are going to, you know, you're going to completely sever your own body's natural ability to produce testosterone. So your testicles will shrink. And some people have even looked into getting like, testicular implants to to look like they used to do if that's something that really is important um but to me it's I the think most that, important it's the most important to look to look good right to have nice looking balls so to me it's so much easier to go at the root to go upstream and address the pregnenolone issue first it's a very cheap and simple supplement so is dhea and by increasing those you can increase your natural production of testosterone without cutting off your, the production from your balls. And good functional medicine doctors know this, but when you're going to the average Joe Blow doctor on the corner who offers PRP and stem cells and all the cool stuff now, I think sometimes these, these people don't really even understand what it is they're offering. They're just offering it because people want it and people will pay money for it and they'll be a customer for life. And that's probably a very controversial perspective. And I'll probably a lot of doctors out there that will argue with me, but I know there are a lot of functional medicine doctors out there that will also agree with me. Okay. Okay. 
That's, 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 that's good. I think something very similar has been said by Jeffrey Gladden, Dr. Jeffrey Gladden. And is, is he also a functional medicine doctor? I'm not sure he was a cardiologist. Um, okay. I love his podcast too. Is there any trade that you do? So can people somehow hire you for something or buy something from you? Ah, how can people give me money? That was the other question you ask everyone. Yes. I love that question. Because just the look on people's faces is like, how can people give me money? I am an anarcho capitalist. Everyone <laughs> has to know that. <laughs> But it's, a, it's an important question, right? It's a great question. It it's, uh, takes us out of our normal paradigm. And I tend to give away like everything that I do for free on my website. But how people can actually give me money is by ordering things off my website. I mean, if you, if you see something that you find interesting, you know, even if it's just like cookware or you know, the things that I use for my garden, or maybe it could be the supplements. It, it could be anything, even some of the biohacking tools that I use. If it's something that you're interested in looking into or, or obtaining, I have discount links on my website. Everybody wins. You know, the advertiser's winning because I'm sharing what I'm using and what I find that works. I'm winning because if you're ordering from my link, I'm making a little bit of a commission. And you're winning because, you know, the, most of these are discount links. You're saving money by ordering. So it's a win-win for everybody. And I'm retired now. So, you know, any income that I, I get from people purchasing through my site is, is a icing on the cake for me. So I'm very appreciative of, of that. Dave Pasco, longest conversation so far, marathon runner. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was great. That was Thank great. You. Thank you. That was fun.